Hello, and welcome hey. to Dry Bones. Welcome. I am here, surprise. <laughs> David, <laughs> I love your hair. Yeah, David. David. Let's not go there, George. <laughs> just Let's just not go there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't even want to start that way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the irony. The irony. I know. It's been so, some changes since last week. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so welcome, everybody, um, to Dry Bones today. I am filling in for David. He is on a sabbatical right now. He's uh, taking a break and hopefully resting up and going to come back refreshed and renewed and rejuvenated and share all these wonderful things that the father has shown him while he's out in the wilderness. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. And Vicki Joy and George are both here with me this evening. So, Hey guys and girls. Hello. Good hey. to be here. Hey Vicki. Hey yeah. George. So how have you guys been this week? Anything new been happening? What's What's been going on? Oh, I, I don't know. You know, I, I'm kind of a little ostrich-like that I kind of stick my head in the sand. Like, believe me, I, I'm well aware of what's going on. I'm actually not all that far away. There's still some, some garbage going on on Lake Street. I think Trump said recently, first the looting, then they're shooting. And the shooting started last week. I think there was like, 12 people shot on Lake Street, one died. And so I know there's a lot of that stuff going on, but I'm four hours north hiding in the woods, writing my book and pretending like I live in the Ronald Reagan years. <laughs> <laughs> if only. Right. Well, good for you. I'm happy that you're able to do that. That's yeah. wonderful. I think that's Denial. a good thing. Yeah. Denial. It's, it's a heck of a drug, man. <laughs> and it's cheaper than therapy. <laughs> it, it is. It is. Yeah. 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 Well, no. I've been pulling weeds. That's what I do for therapy. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I tell you what, every time when I pull weeds, there is nothing that draws me closer to the father than being out in the garden with my face in the dirt, pulling up weeds. I don't know what it is, but wow. it's nice. It's nice to find um, coping mechanisms that are not self-destruct. So many of them, so many things that we go to for comfort are so destructive. And, you know, that's kind of why I'm up here at the cabin all summer. I just want to look at the lake and see the beautiful sunsets and enjoy a season of calm before the storm, basically. So how about you, George? How's, how's things with you? Well, other than eating <laughs> and getting big, uh, just... <laughs> Oh, I can tell. Like, yeah. right? Packing it on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like Vicki Joy. I'm trying to finish up another book, but it's a challenge. And I just, I don't, I have the attention span of a four-year-old. So it is really difficult, but Dude, I'm yeah. plowing through. I am so glad to hear you're working on another book, George. That's great. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens, but. Um, well, yeah, you have to yeah. give me some pointers because I, I, there, there is a book that I would love to write, but I don't even like, I couldn't even tell you where to begin. I thought that so many times and my husband's tried to coach me, but it's like, I can't. You just sit it. and write and then you, yeah. we, we can format later. Just sit and write. Yep. Yeah. Self-discipline. Mm -hmm. Self-discipline. A lot of mm -hmm. guilt. That's where yeah. I'm really, <laughs> really of, bad. That's where I suffer. <laughs> self-discipline. And then invest in wigs because you'll pull your hair out a lot. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Caffeine, self-doubt guilt <laughs> mm -hmm. and then yep. but then somehow miraculously at the end of it there's a manuscript and you're like how did that even happen yeah you know well mm. i see april is in the chat with us she says hi guys and april um for those of you out there that are listening april is normally here with us but she's got a new baby and her husband mm -hmm. is working and so she's got lots of things going on in her home plus she has two other small children so she has a very full plate right now so Definitely. we miss her Hi, she april. said she may pop in Hi, later, but but if not then you know hopefully we'll see her soon <laughs> absolutely absolutely so with that, um, David wanted us to discuss 
this evening, his words are, discuss the moment of grace when Jesus or Yeshua rescued you from the cesspools of this world and made you free to live in love, joy, peace, and happiness. Hmm. So that's a, that's a, that's a good thing to talk about. That's a really um, wonderful thing to talk about for, for me anyways. Um, So either one of you want to start, you have, Something you'd like to? I'll let Vicky go first. She's so <laughs> eloquent. <laughs> oh, <gosh>. Vicky. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let's go for completely anticlimactic up to the climactic. My <laughs> my my testimony is pretty straightforward. You know, I did have the benefit, at least I think it was a benefit, to have been raised in a home with a married mom and dad who were faithful to one another. And, you know, we went to church every Sunday and, you know, I had Sunday school and um, and all that good stuff, you know. But what was going on behind the scenes, there was kind of this, uh, you know, there's a point even when you're raised in the church and you pray to receive Jesus, there's always that point when you kind of reach adulthood where you have to decide on your own is this is this religion of my family heritage going to be my own? And that probably came when I was a sophomore in college, and I was going to a, a bio college. And had no desire to go to college. I had no desire after seventeen years of being teased and made fun of and bullied, and just having absolutely no desire. What? whatsoever to do four more years of socializing with my peers. I was, no way in the world was I going to start that mess over again, but a lot of coercion and bribery and the Holy Spirit. And I I went to this college, which ended up being a wonderful experience and a lot of great things came out of that. But uh, I sort of had this crisis um, when I came back from my sophomore year, you know, typical girl stuff, you know, and, um, You know, I was very, I don't think I realized it at the time. I don't think I realized it until probably I turned 40. I had horrible depression and high anxiety and probably some PTSD, some childhood trauma stuff from all the surgeries and the teasing. But I did not know that in college. I was blissfully, you know, high on youth and thinking that I had the world by the tail and everything was great. And so I kind of had this crisis my sophomore year and, um, even though I was in the middle of a Christian college, um, I didn't really know who to reach out to. And so there was a a guy in one of my classes who just did not seem like your typical college student. He was very serious. He was very sober-minded. I have never heard so much like memorized scripture come out of someone's mouth before. And, you know, I sort of determined in my mind, and you know, even though I had a strict rule about socially interacting with my peers in a nice way that made me think I like them, because I was I had such a huge chip on my shoulder. I was so desperate that I decided if anyone could probably give me some good advice, it's probably this kid. I've never seen anyone who seemed so close to the Lord. And so I just sort of like cold called him one day and was like, Can I talk to you? And so we had to like hide out like in a janitor's closet somewhere and I remember sobbing and crying like some stupid girl, you know, over all this silly stuff. And um, I remember him opening his Bible and reading Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, which I'd never heard before. And I remember I was probably 19. I remember being shocked that someone my age could find a Bible verse that wasn't John 3, 16. Like I could I couldn't believe that this guy could like find a reference in Jeremiah. Like I was in awe that this guy was like a prophet. He could find something in Jeremiah. Right. And and so he read, he read it and we all know it. You know, I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord and it hit home because I don't think I realized until that moment that there really was a lot of future. I got out of college. I got to figure out what to do with my life. I don't have any skills. I don't have this. I don't. And I think I didn't realize how much anxiety I had and, that was a moment where I really, for the first time, felt like God spoke those words directly to me. Like it was a very powerful moment. And I was filled maybe with the first time in my life with this hope that I didn't have to be scared of everything. And I remember writing 
in the margin of my Bible at that time, the, the date, it was January 11, 1991. And that was the day that I chose that, that you know, this is the God that I want to serve. But what started on that day was a realization that I was very, very angry at God. And what took many more years to figure out is that anger was rooted in idolatry. God, why didn't you make me pretty and popular so that everybody would love me and life would be easy and be fun? And why do I have to be, you know, why do I have to be this outcast? And, and so I was really angry, but I realized, you know, much later that that anger was really rooted in idolatry. It was really rooted in the same heart as the the prodigal son. Like, I want my inheritance now. Like, down here, I want to have the currency of popularity and wealth and beauty. And I, I want this to be my inheritance. And, I mean, it took me decades to, to get to that point of realization that that's what, where that anger was stemming from. And so, you know, it was one of those things where it wasn't like this moment where I became a Christian or this moment where I, you know, you know, I mean, I've always had an awareness, but it's one of those things that constantly gets like retroactively revealed to me. And um, there was another huge moment of growth a few years later when um, I started going to a church in downtown Minneapolis that absolutely changed my life. It was in depth, like meat. I mean, it was good theological teaching and I grew leaps and bounds there. And then I had another massive um, season um, of in the wilderness when my mom died and the whole cancer journey and her dying. And, and, and so it's been this kind of like progressive, slow rolling out where, you know, every five to 10 years, there's this massive, like stripping me completely bear of every single thing that I'm dependent upon and then having to start from scratch again mm -hmm. and coming to Torah was another one you know just like we're we are tearing you all the way down to the foundations again and it was exhausting and and it's it's humbling you know when when you're raised in a Christian home and you've heard all the stories a million times and you can find the scripture verses and you've led people to the Lord and you've got scripture memorized there's a point like around 25, 30 years old where you think you've got it all figured out and, and, and then you just learn you've got nothing figured out. And so I, I don't have this like aha moment where it went from dark, evil, black to, Oh, I saw the light. Now everything's great. You know, <laughs> it's just been kind of one extremely difficult, humbling, kicking the teeth after another. You know, but I can that's say the way it is it, for all of us, Vicky Joy. <laughs> that's the way it is, and you know what? It's the way I want it to be. I don't. I don't want to arrive because every time I, every time Yahweh shows me an even deeper depth of who He is, and you are. You cannot believe that there's actually another level up because you thought you plateaued. Yes. And 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 yet the only way to get up to that next level is usually a complete and utter death to self or death to your dreams. All your idols get burned. You know, it's like, you know, in the Old Testament, every time they were going to hit that reset button, all of the idols had to get purged and burned, you know. And yes. how many times has, has you know, the Holy Spirit come into my life and said, you're going to get all the sins of Jeroboam out of your heart and everything just goes up in smoke. And, you know, there, there's a point where, you know, when you're young and you've got your white knuckles around everything and my dreams and my hopes and all this stuff. And there, there's a point where you get to our age and it's just like, I am not even <laughs> curling a finger around this thing. You know, I am just like, everything is going to just be in open hands from this point, because, you know, if God's going to take something, he's going to take it. And I'd rather he takes it like this than having this like horrible arm wrestling going back where, you know, he's got to chop one finger off at a time in order to get it out of your like white knuckle death grip, you know, it's just, it's not worth it. And <laughs> yes. so, so, you know, I don't know if that's <laughs> helpful. Um, or if it even answers the question, but, you know, I, I, I'm still young in light of eternity. If we're, if we are eternal beings, um, I'm, 
I'm like this far into this journey. And so um, I haven't arrived. I, you know, have I been taken out of cesspools and brought onto, you know, that Psalm 40 place, like where he sets my, he makes my footsteps firm and sets me on a higher rock. Absolutely. Absolutely. But every time my footsteps are made firm in that place and a new song is put in my mouth, you know, time goes by and you realize I'm still basically at the, the base of this mountain. There are still so many like clefts that I have to get up and my knuckles are going to get bloody and I'm going to get more and more dehydrated and it's going to get harder to breathe the higher I get up. But but to, to reach that mountaintop and to to have the the glory of, of Yahweh shining on us. Like we arrived, you know, and, and um, I just, I know that there's more um, trials ahead of me as well. And there'll be more humbling and there'll be more ripping things out of my grip. But every time I get past the worst of it, and I'm sure George can attest to this too, once you everything you fear is going to happen if you let go once you get through the fear and every you let go of everything and not only is it as bad as you thought it was but it was horrible once you can get past that and look back on it it's like oh thank god he pulled that thing out of my hand i didn't even realize that like this thing i was gripping onto was trying to kill me and and so for me my life has just been a very slow journey of progress where God mercifully just gives me one little bite at a time because if he shoved the whole thing down my throat I would just choke and die and so I know I probably have a lot longer to go um I'm just hoping and praying that by the time it's all said and done I mean I have assurance of my salvation I'm not doubting that but I just I just want I just want to know that when I when I get to the end of this um, and I hear the well done good and faithful servant, I just um, I, I just don't want to get to heaven. I always tell people I don't want to get to heaven for all that I've gone through and just sit in the nosebleed section. We're way way there. If I squint, I can kind of see this little like pinhole of light, and I just know that that's you know you know Jesus sitting on the throne like. And I don't want to be sitting at his right hand, you know, with a big blue ribbon on my my shirt either. But <laughs> but I just I I did not go through, you know, however many decades of hell I'm going to have to endure on this cesspool of a planet. I I at least want to know that for eternity, I will be in his presence, and that I, you know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I want to be in his presence. I don't want to just see him once a year during the festivals, you know what I mean? I just, I, yes. so for that, it, however many more seasons of, however many more dark nights of the soul I have coming, I'll take them, I'll, I'll take them. I might not enjoy them, but if in the end, I can sit at his feet for eternity instead of being in the nosebleed section, um, it will be worth whatever I go through. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Vicki, you have such an amazing way of putting, you have, you have, I love how you um, put things into words, how you describe mm -hmm. things. You have a, you have a beautiful way of putting things into pictures. Um, mm. and so, you know, a couple of things that, um, that I picked up on is it's funny because I think it was yesterday, George and I, where um, we were doing Georgia's testimony for Warrior Women of Faith. And um, we were talking about uh, that similar thing about how, but what I relate it to is pruning. Uh, mm -hmm. I call it a season of pruning that we go through. And that's why I think, like you said, that it's, um, you know, every so often you're experiencing this. And that's because, you know, every so often, just like a tree or a plant, it has to be pruned back in order for it to bloom and to blossom and to flourish even bigger. And so that's what happens. You know, sometimes we have to have, you know, things cut down and chopped off and moved away from us so that our attention's not on anything else but him and he can you know, get through to us and we can hear him clearly. 
you know, because a lot of times we get distracted very easily oh, yeah. from the things around us and the things that, you know, that we put <laughs> most, right. you know, we put before him really. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sometimes he has to move those things away, whether it's, you know, people, family, you know, our, our circumstances, whatever it is, sometimes all those things have to be pulled away so that we, he can get through to us and we can hear him, you know, with our spiritual ears and he has yeah. to cleanse our spirit. He has to bring us back to that awareness of, you know, the present because we get so caught up in, you know, all of this other stuff that's that's going on around us and we think about what happened yesterday and what's going to happen tomorrow but really mm -hmm. jesus just said give us this day let's let's focus on the day let's get through today and then you know tomorrow will have its own anxiety <laughs> tomorrow yeah. has its own stuff that's going to happen so really <laughs> yeah it's not going to do you any good to worry about it today yeah and uh but you know the the other thing that i you talked about was um, sometimes you, you know, you feel like you're, you don't want to be force fed. And that's something that the father has shown me recently. And I've been saying, I want to do a, I want to do a show or talk about this is he says in his word to taste and see that I am good. Mm -hmm. Now, when you taste something, do you put a whole bunch of that? I think, uh, I think that, um, April and I talked about this too. You don't put a whole gob of something in your mouth that you've never mm -hmm. had before that you don't, you're not sure about. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You just take yeah. a little bit, you pinch it off or you put that little bit in your mouth to taste it and see you wait, you savor it, you think about it, mm, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what he says. Taste and see that I am good. Mm -hmm. just don't try to cram it in. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do so much. You know, we try to cram things, you know, on ourselves and on other people. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that never works. It never works. Yeah, so, absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime. And, and not like I've never said it either. I, I've learned it the hard way. Anytime I hear someone in the midst of trial say, I just want it to be over. I just want it to be done. I'm like, okay, you got to back mm -hmm. up. Because yeah. as long as your only motive is get me out of pain, Oh, you know, because it, he, the, the father just works. He's not his ultimate goal isn't that we have this like, um, you know, dopamine rush at every moment. And, you know, and so whatever he's pruning, like you said, I mean, you ever thought about how graphic the metaphors are in scripture. I mean, marathons. I mean, I think most people get to the end of the finish line if they even make it and they're sick for three days and they're dehydrated and they're throwing up. And yeah. and then you've got tons of military and war metaphors. And then you've got these, you know, gardening and harvest metaphors where yokes and, and pruning shears are coming out and, you know, yes. it, you know, you can prune a branch and it just falls to the, to the ground. But when, when you prune a human being, there is blood all yeah. over. Our heart is <laughs> decimated. And, you know, I mean, there's just been so many times where. I don't know, like it when I cut my toenails too short. That's less <laughs> than anything else. <laughs> I know, right? I know. <laughs> So I don't know, you know, you know, the verse in scripture where it says, you know, remember we are dust. And I, I kind of have my take on that is like, yeah, I want, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I don't want to have one of these Hezekiah moments where I roll over in self pity and look at the wall and sob and beg for something you don't want to give me or, you know, whatever was going on in that somewhat confusing story. But I always say, Yahweh, remember that I'm like this fragile like little glass figurine and like one false move and I'm going to shatter into a million pieces so please just if you're gonna like throw me to the ground could you put some bubble wrap around me because <laughs> you know oh. I just I feel so frail in those moments and, and that's so much of so much of our faith and so much of tasting and seeing is if I if I fall to the ground and if I shatter into a million pieces, do I have this faith like Abraham? Like, well, if my son dies, he'll I'll just raise him from the dead. Like, cause right. I spend so much time 
fearing how many pieces I'm going to shatter into if I fall to the ground again. And that's not, you, we have to have this trust that the father's not going to drop us and, um, and that we can't just go around all day in this very frightening world, just living in fear of when we're going to slip out of his hands. Well, and he shatter. tells us that he knows how many hairs are on our head. There's no possible way well, maybe some of us, we could count how many hairs are on our head, but <laughs> most of us, we don't know. And I, I'm, I used, I'm a, been a beautician for many, many years. Oh. And so, you know, and then he tells us, you know, that he knows the, the number of grains of sand in the ocean. So I remind myself of these things. He knows how many hairs are on my head. He know, he, he know, he knew me before I was formed in my womb and he takes care of the sparrows and the lilies. So mm -hmm. how much more does he care for us? You know, so I have to remind myself of those things sometimes, Vicki, because I, you know, we all get that way. We all get, you know, caught up and, and yeah. feel. Yeah. Like I, I think the thing that I struggle with a lot is, you know, we have these like totem poles, which is maybe a bad analogy, but, you know, we always have that thing on the top of the totem pole. And mine is always this like disproportionate self protection and trying to get it through my thick skull that God is my strength and my shield. He's my rock. He's my fortress. And, you know, he is my war club. He is my song, you know, and when I think of like, he is my song, it's not just like worship songs. I think, you know, the, the singers were the front of the army, you know, they, the, the front of the war were, were these singers and he goes before me into these battles and he sings over me. And, and so to getting to this place and George and I've talked about this before and where we, ha whatever armor we've built for ourselves, which a lot of times our identity is our armor. Okay. And when you get to that place where you surrender everything to, to God, he says, okay, hand over the armor because like, I'm going to be your, your shield, right. You know, from this point yeah. forward. And when you start handing over your armor, you're handing over everything you're handing over your your friends and your clothes and your, your entertainment and, you know, your jewelry and your shoes, like everything, because so much of our identity, it, it, it permeates every part of our personality. And it's not just, you know, stripping off this idea of like, you know, okay, I'm not going to hang around with that, that click anymore. Your whole identity has to come down to the studs basically. And, you know, I, I have spent, a good portion of the last 25 years of my life figuring out that I still have pieces of my own armor on and you know God keeps telling me to hand it over and I'm like that too like <laughs> no, I I need that man that's a survival thing you know and so <laughs> you know you, you kind of feel like you're out in the middle of the war buck naked but you know we have to understand when God says I am a shield about you like what do we really think that means like he's not penetratable right right so yeah awesome yeah that's that's exactly right and it's it's all about trust it's all about trusting him mm. so and like vicky said you know when he wants you to turn that over you know one of the things that i learned being in los angeles and especially in the lgbt community which is very dog eat dog and people are constantly trying to tear you down yeah. there is a an armor and a, a hardened a hardness that you develop a thick skin mm -hmm. and that ability to check people when they try to rip you apart. And I have really had to learn how to rein in that ability, that desire to want to rip someone to shreds who just mm -hmm. crosses me the wrong way. And it's yeah. that defense mechanism. It's called survival. And I know you yep. guys know it, Absolutely. but yeah, God has really had to work on that with me as well in terms of how to extend more grace versus um well you know there's a lot of phrases <laughs> about cutting people but yeah. anyway mm -hmm. you have to learn to um, be more christ-like and it is a challenge because some people just yeah. want to see how much they can walk all over you and take advantage of you and i've really had to learn mm. um, that the hard way and then the other thing that vicky said about um 
you know, the new plateau and as you learn and grow. And I'm sometimes at that point of where I don't want to learn anything else. I don't want to be a better human being. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave me alone. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, but you know, we got to, we got to run the race and finish it. So you do what you got to do. Yeah. yeah. And April says vulnerable is scary. She said, you have to remind yourself you're upgrading, not stripping down. Oh, that's great. That's a good point. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Well, I really liked what you said, Faye, about even God. I mean, it was really such a great reminder about God knowing the number of hairs on your head and the grain, the number of grains of sand. Mm -hmm. My biggest fear is being homeless. And I don't know why I have, huh. I think in Los Angeles, that just really I struggled all of the time from paycheck to paycheck. And there was this drive uh, and this desire to survive all of the time. And do, especially due to this fear of being homeless. And I find sometimes it's still hard to just relax and be, be in God's presence. Cause I'm a very task oriented person to do list driven that way. And that thought of just sitting down and waiting to see if God's going to talk to me drives me nuts because it's like, God, I have things to do. If you're going to talk to me, please do. And if you're not, I've got so much to do. So oh, wow. it, it, it's a challenge. Can we schedule for four? No. Exactly. I have come to the conclusion that, you know, they talk about the type A personality. You know, you're driven, task oriented, details, get things done. Why put off tomorrow what you can do today? And then the type B is the person that really just goes with the flow. If it gets done, that's okay. And if it doesn't, there's always tomorrow. And I have come to the conclusion that God is a type B personality and I'm the type A and we're in this battle because, <laughs> you know, I'm on this bullet train and he's on the skateboard and I'm like, come on already. I've got things to do. Time is short. So we got, I, I trust that God has a sense of humor and he's patient. Thankfully. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. He is and he does and he will. He he knows the desires of our heart. He knows the innermost parts. And, you know, that's what he amazes me with sometimes because there's things and I don't want this to sound. <laughs> sometimes, you know, there's things that I just think about. I think, man, I'd love to have this or I'd love to be able to do this or something like that. And the father provides it somehow out of nowhere. And I'm not saying that he's a miracle God. And you, you, well, OK, I shouldn't even I don't even know how I'm going to word this. But anyways, you know, so to me, it just shows me how he knows the very intentions of my heart sometimes mm -hmm. Far beyond what I know. And it's not like I even voice, you know, certain things. It's just that he knows. And so he he says here, you know, I'm, I'm going to give this to you or I'm going to do this for you. And it's not always it's not material things. It's sometimes it's spiritual things that I, I think about or I want. And then he provides and mm -hmm. it, it shows me how much more I can trust him and how much more. He knows me than I know myself because, you know, I try to rely on myself, you know, and, yeah. and that's the problem is I get in the way all the time and he has to remove me. He has to, me he has to prune me. <laughs> well, well, when and, Vicky was mentioning about, um, you know, or even Faye, when you're talking about the pruning process and Vicki, as we have to learn and grow and go through stuff. And there are some people who just want to quickly get through it. Mm -hmm. I think in each of our cases, and I can't, I don't know you that well, Faye, but I, I believe this would be a true statement. I, I, I'm certain that Vicki will understand this, but you know, when God gets a hold of you and he starts to do that refining and changing your life and turning things upside down, which is so uncomfortable. I think the blessing about all three of us then, at least for me and Vicki, I know at least knowing her story is when you've gone through hell, what God is doing is, is not any worse. It could not get any worse, but we know that God is not right. going to do something to make things worse. So when you are rock bottom and you are just in this metaphorically speaking, hell, 
and you just want to kill yourself because you just don't know how you got to where you were. Well, the blessing in surrendering it to God is, is you have nothing to lose. It can't get any worse as right. far as I'm concerned. Right. And I think for people who've had an easy life, that is more of a challenge for them than those of us who've really struggled our whole lives with yes. whatever that bondage is or whatever we've been through. So it's not that I have found the process to be something that I resented. I'm just tired of hurting and I'm tired. I want God to quickly get it done and over with so I can just get on with life. And I think that's why I really love therapy. And I never understood people who will go to counseling and sit there for years, but they don't do the work because right. it's too uncomfortable. I would rather go in and do two years of hard work, crying, tears, feeling it, talking it out, working through it. Because once you do, you come out on the other side of it and you have this great life ahead of you because you finally put to bed a lot of the darkness, the poor decisions, the patterns that you're doing to where it has brought you to where you're living in this hell. Yeah. And once you wake up, and you get this insight and knowledge and realize, wow, I can change. And this is not to take away not letting God work in our lives, but you can make better decisions about things that you're doing and about the type of people you let in your life. And of course, for me, going through counseling, the blessing was that out of all of the years of stupidity, and there have been many, I finally got smart. And I would always ask God to have the Holy Spirit be a part of my counseling session. And I was surprised at the times where I would go in not wanting to work through the issues, mm. being tired, but or feeling mm. like, oh, I've got this. I'm <laughs> I'm in such a better place. I'm so healthy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would get in there <laughs> and God <laughs> and God yeah. would have the counselor ask me something that I had completely forgotten about or bring yes. up an issue or think of something that I had never thought of, or perhaps bring to mind something that really was a trauma or something that has really been a part of the painful process. And so it was such a blessing to go through that and just ask the Holy Spirit to also be a part of your counseling session. So what a great friend that we do have. And I thank God for that patience, because I think we can all agree out of everything that we've been through it, even though it has been painful, that is the only way we're going to grow. Yes. And there's something about uh, the painful process of when God gets a hold of you, that when he opens your spiritual eyes and gets you out of the worldly mindset and you get things into perspective and you really get your feet grounded and your head on straight, man, is it a great place to be after you've just lived so many years in darkness and dysfunction? Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I think George, kind of along those lines, I think a lot of times when we're bringing an immediate situation to God and we wonder why it's taking so long, a lot of times it's because in my experience, it's been um, God doesn't just want to heal your immediate situation. He wants to go all the way back to the root and heal everything. Yeah. And I mean, I just remember after my mom died and I had this grief in front of me and I was just like, okay, God, let's, let's deal with the grief. And every day my prayers were grief related and, you know, grief is a healthy thing, not, you know, it's, it's a healthy coping mechanism, but I just wanted it to be, I didn't like it. I'm not a crier. This was, I did not enjoy this. And <laughs> I like being in staunch control of my emotions. I like to have a poker face at all times. I don't want people to know what I'm thinking. I want to be one step ahead. So when you're in grief, and you're, you're just like, you know, you're just shopping. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, my mom used to make that, you know, and I, oh, I hated it. It was so horrible. But um, I remember one day just like, God, I can't take this anymore. Like the, the textbooks say 18 to 24 months and we're 48 months into this. What's going on? And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I still remember the day, George, this, this was my Holy Spirit moment. It was like, God, when are we done with this grief? And God was like, you still don't get it. I'm not trying to heal what happened 12 to 18 months ago. I'm going all the way back to the womb when you were born, these birth effects, yes. these surgeries, the bullying, the anxiety that came from it, the depression that came from it, the way you cope and view the world. Like you are right here today because it goes all the way back. And I'm going all the way back to the root, which you haven't even figured out yet. 
And I realized, oh, okay, the reason why my grief was, you know, five years of practically a nervous breakdown in hell was because God wasn't content to answer my stupid little prayer about help me to feel good today. I want to be happy today. He was like, let's get rid of four decades of accumulating garbage and let's clear your heart and your mind out so that you can start from scratch and not carry this pilgrim's progress bundle around on your back this whole journey. The journey is going to get harder. We start going uphill and the older we get, it gets harder. And if we are still carrying around that junior high stuff, like there's a point where you got to jettison this garbage in order to get through the last rough, steep cliffs that you have to, to get up. And so a lot of times that it's not that, oh, you know, God just loves sanctifying us. And, you know, no, it's that when we pray for healing, he takes our prayer so much more seriously than we're taking yes. it. We just want today to be good. And he's like, well, you know, there's 40 years worth of today's that weren't good that we got to deal with. And so there's always love and mercy behind it. You know, we've already said it even on this show. It, it's not like he's just dragging it out for the sake of, you know, teaching us some character. It, like there's purpose in everything that he does. And like, like George said, it, it, you're, it's not going to get any worse. So you may as well surrender because even if you have to go through five, 10 years of really hard staring yourself in the mirror and confessing sins and realizing your own fault and participation in your own sin and idolatry that has gotten you to that point, we're not all just these little victims that get carried into bad situations because poor us. And so it takes time, but he, he is very intentional like he's not just coming up with obstacle courses you know just for the sake of you know coming up with with tough stuff you know there's there's intention to every single thing that that he's putting us through so if we can submit to it um we will be the better for it and the bottom line is is that you may as well sub surrender and submit the sooner you do it the sooner you can go through that process and get it over with. Yep. If you try to fight God, you're going to lose and you're just prolonging the situation and it's yep. going to be more misery. And yep. it really is. It, it's really just humbling yourself and just surrendering. And that's hard when you are a control freak. Like you say, Vicki, you, you know, you're not going to let people see the anything. You're going to keep your shield up and you're strong and you're a warrior and you're not going to ever be hurt again. And you have all these walls and this defenses and God is going to break every bit of it down. Yes, he is. So get well, ready for a it. Time. There's a time for everything. There's a time to be a warrior and to have that staunch face and to have your armor on and to be mm -hmm. ready for battle but yeah. there's also a time to be soft and moldable and humble and allow him to be able to work with us. And we have to be, we have to be soft and pliable for him to be able to, to use us and yeah. to mold us in the way that he wants to. And that, you know, that is probably one of the hardest lessons for me to learn is, you know, like, like you were talking about Vicki being in control because I knew for so many years that I had to be in control. There was nobody else that was going to take care of me. Nobody else was going to watch over me. Nobody else was going to protect me, but yeah. me. And so therefore, you know, I had to, I had to be on top of everything mm -hmm. and, you know, it's not possible. It's not possible. I, I failed, you know, miserably at that, mm -hmm. but I think to myself that that's what I can do. But, you know, when I pray, father, I want to be healed completely. Then, you know, he says, well, what, what does he want from me? He wants obedience. He wants me to obey. And, you know, I, I heard his voice tell me that uh, a couple of years ago. And I had been fasting. And at the end of my fast, I was standing in the kitchen and I was eating. And I put something in my mouth before I gave thanks for it. 
and immediately I realized that right after I finished fasting and I, I just immediately was like, father, I'm so sorry. Thank you for this food. And he said, I heard him say, no, thank you. And I was like, what? I mean, that's really, I think I even said it out loud. What? (laughs) (laughs) And he said, thank you for being obedient. Mm -hmm. And man, that was so powerful to me. I mean, I immediately just started bawling, you know, because that's all he wanted. That's all he wants from us is for us to obey him, to seek his face. You know, April and I, April uh, Lockhart and I talked about seek his face and obey my commands. Yeah. And that's the thing. um, When it comes to people, who are in bondage or they're torn about their sin or whatever it is that they're dealing with in life. The bottom line really is, yes, we're going to struggle, but do we ever, I think for me, I had to come to the realization that when I can go and do it, it's not going to affect my salvation because that's, it's the rejection of Christ uh, that sends a person to hell. But if I truly love God, why would I continue doing something that's going to grieve him and hurt his feelings? And how many, many of us ever stop to think as we're struggling with these things? You know what? I should not think of this as a struggle as much as I want to stop doing it. Because why on earth do we want to hurt God and hurt his feelings? Mm -hmm. And so I know in my prayer time, there are times I just say to God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, I'm so sorry whenever I do things that grieve any of you. And it's Mm -hmm. not intentional. I am human. I'm going to fall. But I try to do my best. But so I don't see the denying running out here and having sex with a lot of people or doing drugs or drinking as this burden as much as it grieves God. So just stop doing it. Mm -hmm. And it may be a challenge for people who really do have some addictions. And as someone who had a sex addiction and, and of course battled drugs and alcohol, it still is something to where you have to come to the place of what matters more, your selfish desires or God and his feelings. Mm -hmm. Because do we ever stop to think what God was feeling on that day when Jesus was put on the cross? And how he was going to have to turn his back on his only son. And how do we do we stop to think about Jesus as he's on that cross paying for all of these sins that we've committed, past, present, and future, and to know that his own father is has turned his back on him. That transaction, how it had to have grieved and hurt both of them, but this was something that needed to be done. And I think we as humans, we just take this stuff lightly. As if, mm-hmm. well, oh, well, Jesus died. I'm under grace now. I'm going to go do what I want. Right. And it's offensive. It it's is. disgusting. And mm-hmm. until we get to that place of where we say, you know what? I need to stop being self-centered and selfish about this and stop seeing this as a burden to have to give it up as much as I want to give this up. It's mm-hmm. the least I could do considering what God has done for me. And, and with what Jesus suffered on the cross Jesus did all of the suffering. He did all of the work, but yet I get all of the gain. I get Mm -hmm. the glory uh, of a a body that no longer will suffer and break down, and I get to spend eternity in heaven, and I get to be with Christ, and all of these wonderful things that come with it. I mean, who are we to complain of 10, 15, 20 years of having to deny ourselves of a few things? (laughs) And that's really where it had to hit home with me that, you know what, get over yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm, I agree. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, George, I kind of had a similar process and (laughs) this is actually, this is embarrassing. This is hard to admit because I like to project myself as somewhat intelligent and this is going to sound so stupid, but (laughs) I, in the all, just to go to, to, to explain to you all the lengths I went to, to protect myself and be in control of my own survival. I actually consciously believed for many, many, many years, if I don't get married, I won't be under the curse because that curse was, you know, involving striving with a husband. And so if I don't have one, I won't have that struggle and everything will be great. It'll be me and God. And I I remember 10 years ago, maybe I remember I was staying with friends in Virginia and I was having a quiet time and 
it just downloaded into me in, in an instant. Vicki, your whole life is so bound up in seeing everything 10 steps ahead and trying to account for things and hyper analyzing things and controlling everything and making sure that everything's in place. What you don't realize is the curse has to do with wanting to be in control and make yeah. all your own decisions. And you are under the curse, but because I'm your husband, I'm the husband that you're striving against. I'm the one you're offending. I'm the one you're walking all over. I'm the one you're giving the finger to. I'm the one that you're not listening to. I'm the one whose authority you don't have any respect for. You're trying to run your own life. You still are under that curse. And it was so shocking for me, literally in my 30s, having walked with God for decades, thinking I am under the curse. And instead of hurting a husband, I, I have been slapping God in the face. God is saying, I want to protect you. I want to provide for you. I want to take care of you. I want to heal your wounds. And you just want to get out your pocket planner and tell me what my honey-do list is every day. Knock it off, you know? And oh my gosh, it was so humbling. And, and, and so to just realize that, you know, we are all under that curse where you know, Adam, our forefather, you know, what, what appealed to him? What did the enemy use to tempt him away? You could be your own God. You could be his God. You can yes. control the to-do list. You can, I mean, I'm a huge to-do list person and I got it from my mom and my mom on her deathbed was fretting over her to-do list. There were things on that to-do list that weren't going to get done. And that was a wake up <laughs> call for me. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> um, but when we start waving that to-do list in God's face every day, which I do without even thinking about it, because for me, it's like an anxiety relief, you know, and oh, to just, I, I'm not what you said, George, but it is, we take it lightly. It is so offensive. And we just think that Jesus is our homeboy. And he, every day he's like, what do you need today? And I'm not saying he doesn't <laughs> care about us, but. Our magic genie. But yeah. this idea that we somehow dictate the direction of what's supposed to happen every day with our life and like, okay, God, here's what I need taken care of and, you know, fix all my problems and make life as easy as possible. And, you know, we're all just striving. It, and then we get mad if it's, if it's not, we get yeah. upset with him and blame him if things don't go the way we wanted them to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. We are all the prodigal son. I want my inheritance right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you're going to have to wait, you know, un until Jesus comes back and you're in those resurrection, but you will get your inheritance for eternity. And like George said, can we give up a few fleeting pleasures for 40, 50, 60, 80 years, which is a, a blade of grass, you know, yeah. getting chopped in a mower in, com in comparison to eternity. Like, and, and, oh, I've just been so, convicted since my mom died about how much of the spirit of the prodigal son is in my heart, how I want to be relieved from all of my stress and anxiety right now. I want, I want Jesus to come and give me this perfect resurrection body life. Now I can't wait any, I'm going to squander it. And I'm, I haven't figured out a way to, to, to work myself out of that. But so many times I, I get that tap on my shoulder, like you're doing it again. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, George, I would like to hear your moment of grace story. Mm. Well, I was in the homosexual lifestyle for 25 years, and I won't rehash all of that because it's on plenty of media interviews. But I your women of faith dot org. It's mm -hmm. playing right now this week. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yes. Good plug, Faye. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't plan that, by the way. <laughs> Love you, David. <laughs> yeah. But I would say the grace for me in looking back on having gone through that life, there are times where I have been so resentful of having had to go through this. Hmm. And when I see people on Facebook, people I knew when they were young and they were popular or homecoming queen or football players, or they were just the jocks or whatever it is. And they seem to have such a wonderful life and dating and they got married. They have their kids, their grandkids. They have the nice home. They're getting ready to wind down for retirement. 
And here I had to sit on the sidelines and get settled with something that I didn't understand. And for this to have pretty much control and dictate my whole life and my choices mm -hmm. to where now in my 50s, I'm trying to rebuild my life because God has had to turn. He just completely flipped my world upside down. And I try not to be bitter and be thankful for it because I know there are millions of people who have a way worse lives. And so I'm certainly never want to come off like I'm complaining or want a pity party, but I've had to see it. Like for instance, with Joseph, how, what he went through him, not understanding being sold into slavery, being falsely accused of rape, spending time in prison, but eventually becoming the second person in command that was going to save two nations. <laughs> None of us know exactly why we have been dealt the cards that we've been dealt with and what God is going to use us for. And so even with you, Vicki and Faye, with whatever you've been through, I think the blessing and hardships and not having an easy life is that you have a lot more empathy and compassion for people and people who are broken and people who are hurting. And I wouldn't trade that for the world. The other blessing for me, and I think this is really uh, a gift from God, is that having gone through just my own journey, had I grown up and everything been fine and I just went to church and I, I had this perfect life, I don't think I would ever truly understand God's grace and his mercy. Because I've talked about it before, the night that I was going into a gay bar in Fort Lauderdale, when God turned down the noise of everything around me and said, if you were to die tonight, would you go to hell? I still to this day do not understand why God did not take my life that night because I completely dismissed him. And I wasn't in church and I had no godly influence and I hated him and I let him know it and I hated Christians and screw everybody. It was all just about the, the club scene. And... I have so many times thanked God for his patience and his endurance and long suffering and allowing me to have to go through that unnecessary pain and to veer off the path to learn some very hard lessons to get back to where I am today. I wish I hadn't had to go through them. It's still very painful to think about, very emotional to think about it because I, I get so tired from the journey sometimes. But mm -hmm. again, if it helps us to have a more intimate relationship with God as a result of having gone through that, then it is a blessing. So it is not easy, but I think to answer the question, and I hope I'm answering it, and if not, David can get over it. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just very... God really... He is loving. He's merciful. That's all I can say. We deserve. I, I, I do not deserve his mercy. The fact that with what I've seen with the number of people who have in the LGBT community, especially when you're meeting random strangers on the Internet, people that I know who've been murdered, people who've died of drug overdoses, people who have contact contracted AIDS, people who have committed suicide. How is it that I came through that? unscathed. I mean, I went through a lot of stuff, but how is it that I survived? I really believe that it was the faithful prayers of my parents and Christians in my life where I felt like, well, maybe God really had a, a covering and a, his hand on my life to allow me to survive that because having been a prostitute and having put myself in some very scary and dangerous situations, how did I survive all of that with my and also with my sanity <laughs> intact? Mm -hmm. Although mm -hmm. some might question that. But um, I think what I would say to any individual who's going through something and you don't understand how you are where you are today because it wasn't a conscious choice. You just got lost somewhere in the process. Mm -hmm. But I hope that you will stop and see that if God has done what he has done for us three, that he can also do it for them. And there is hope. And God really can turn it around. Yeah, it's painful. We want it done immediately. We were so tired of the pain and the depression and the suicidal thoughts. But God is going to do it in his own time. But it, I, I will tell you, if you want to rush the process, you must leave the world and completely surrender to Christ. Mm -hmm. Submit yourself to God.
and read his word and what he says do, do it. And what he says don't do, don't do it. And get into counseling if you can. Have the Holy Spirit be a part of it. Feel that pain and work through it. If you will do that and let God clean house, however he does it, if people start falling by the wayside, don't complain. Just bid them farewell because what you lose, God is going to replace that in so many other ways. And it's a matter of trust. And that's where it is difficult for a lot of people because I don't know about you guys, but when people hurt you as much as they've hurt me and I don't trust easily, I do tend to put that on God as well. Well, he's someone else who's going to eventually turn on me or hurt my feelings, or he's going to let me down or abandon me or stab me in the back. And I have to stop and remember that's not God's ammo. And that's unfair to put that on him. What people have done to me. Yeah. Amen. George, um, you know, you were talking about why you, you have these feelings of why did I, why did I survive? Why did the father bring me through this? And I've thought that so many times I've asked him that I've asked him that question and I've never really gotten a clear answer other than what I think is, um, you know, because there is so many times that I can tell you that I, I don't know, I don't know why or how I came through the things that I did. Um, but other than maybe it's for now because now I'm able to talk about the things that caused me pain. I'm able to um, tell others about the hope of Jesus Christ and it doesn't hurt me anymore. I, so I can talk about these things. I can share it with other people. And so maybe he brought me through all of that for this time in my life. Maybe it's somewhere in, you know, down the road. I don't know. I don't know what the purpose is or what the reason is, but that's what I, that's kind of what I go with because, um, you know, there's, there's been plenty of opportunity, you know, I've, I've come close to um, dying twice in my life. Mm. And, you know, there's been times when I wanted to die. I wanted to take my own life. I ended up in the hospital one time because of it. And so, you know, I have, I have, you know, been through that myself and, you know, now the father, I, I've always felt like my pain and the suffering that I went through is a gift that the father gave me because now I can share that with other people. And I know there are so many people out there who have been abused and who have been hurt. And that's why, that's why I wanted to do what I'm doing right now. That's why I wanted to start talking because I, and you know, I felt like the father prepared me for that for years. He told me years and years ago, I can't even tell you how many years that he was going to have me talking and sharing my story. I, I didn't know how or when or what, but you know, and there's not a lot of people that listen to me, but that's okay. If there's one person that listens, that's the, that's my heavenly father. He's listening. If he approves, because he's the one that called me to this, this is not of my own accord. I'm not sitting here because I, I want to, I'm sitting here because he, he wants me here. And so therefore, if he's happy with that, you know, I pray that there's somebody out there that's listening, that the father might be calling or that is in pain, that is hurting, that can be helped from what I have to say or from what you have to say, George. Mm. Well, may I say, and I hope this will encourage someone who has been going through some stuff and maybe God has been putting it on their heart to open up and share what they've been through. And Vicky, Joe, I'm sure all I'm sure you guys know this. Satan loves to use the shame card Absolutely. to keep us quiet. Yes. And opening up and sharing my testimony, which I will tell you real quickly, I was sharing at two services at a church in Los Angeles. And this was brand new for me. And I didn't like this thing of being vulnerable. Vicky, I know you'll get that. <laughs> and after I sat down after speaking the first after the first service, 
I'm telling you, I got so worked up. I felt so vulnerable and I didn't like mm -hmm. it. It was very mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And I was getting ready to run out of that church. <laughs> mm -hmm. And God so perfectly timed it as I was getting ready to exit that church and not come back. This older gentleman, he grabbed me, this big burly dude, and he put his hand on my shoulder and I looked up and he said, I want you to know I've always had a hard hearted attitude towards homosexuals. But what you said today really convicted me and it has changed my thinking on this. And it was as if God used that. And I just this calm came over me. Hmm. And from that point on, I just made a conscious decision. I don't care what people think about what I share. It's not about glamorizing it. Mm -hmm. But I told God before I released my book, I feared what the world would think and especially what my parents would think if they read it because they didn't know what I had been through. But mm -hmm. I just said, God, if there is a teenager in middle America who's getting ready to commit suicide, and if, if something in my book or my story can relate to them and help them, give them hope, I trust you will get that book in their hands. Mm -hmm. And I had to stay focused on that. And I want to say to anyone who has a story to tell, your story is valuable because you're going to be able to speak words that Faye, Vicky, and I aren't going to be able to speak that is probably going to reach that individual. And what better way to make something horrible, something good come from something horrible by seeing someone's life changed by merely sharing what you've been through. Mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to stop with the shame, stop worrying about what people think. Yep, think of that yes. person right now who is broken and they're hurting and they feel like there's no hope. And what greater joy other than hopefully giving a, a person a moment of hope, but that they possibly come to know Christ. And for me, like Vicki earlier, when you said about when you're single, it's really just you and God. And that's why I don't focus on trying to have a a wife or anything, because right now I'm enjoying my time and my relationship with Christ. And I want to see people come to know Christ. I want people out of bondage. And when I stand before God, my life is as, as much of a mess as it has been. I want to be able to say to God, you gave me a second chance and I made the most of it. It may not yeah. have been perfect, but I don't want to stand before him and have nothing to show for my life. I'd like to at least think I want at least one person to Christ in that process. Yes. Amen. So it's the least I could do. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, and just the theme of this whole month, Faye, and on your show, pride versus humility and pride being, you know, kind of the buzzword for the LGBTQ community. Um, something you just said, George, just triggered a memory. I forgot all about this. I went through a lengthy phase, probably didn't go away until my 30s, where if I ever was vulnerable, like if I told someone my story or something that had hurt me, I would have, I would go home and I would have this like emotional hangover for like a week. I would have rage and self-loathing that I let that person have that pearl, you know, and I was so upset with myself and I would determine next time, don't tell them anything, be an iron cage, you know, and I I would just hate myself when I weakened and I shared my heart with someone. And that's shame. That It's pride and it's shame. It's this like the mark of a strong human being is someone who never breaks. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, probably, I know I learned it the hard way when you keep all of that stuff bottled up for decades, it just poisons the inside of you and yes. you just become so cynical and so jaded and it does start to turn on God. Like, you know, everyone stabbed me in the back and God's got all this power and he won't help me. And like, and it just, it just, poisons you from the inside out and you know um especially like because i spend most of my time you know talking and counseling with women and you know we are such a product of this feminism craze of the last several decades and this lie that women have bought into about how we have to be strong you know and women can be strong but i don't think that Strength is not, I'm never going to cry. I'm never going to show any emotion. I'm never going to apologize. I'm never going to, you know, uh, I'm never going to crack. You know, that is not strength. That is a weak ab individual. Absolutely yeah. the most insecure, scared to death, self protective weakness there it's is fear. imaginable. It's, it's fear. fear. It's fear. And there is a power in what George just said. When we share our testimonies, 
I could sit in eloquently write out some theological little thing and and yet if I could if I give my testimony and I tell people about you know what I went through it, oh my gosh if there's such power at Faye you were there at Occupy when I gave my testimony that's probably the first time I've given my testimony and you I didn't want to do it because here's the way Satan gets at my pride that's arrogant. You're stealing glory from God when you yes. talk about yourself instead of gospel. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you know. And so I got up and Faye, I was supposed to get up and promo my book. That's all I was supposed to do is like say, hey, I got books for sale. And I got up there. I had no idea what to say. I did not want to give my testimony, but I felt the spirit was telling me to. And Faye, I can't even tell you the ripple effect of that that's still going on to this day. And the people that yes. befriended me there at that conference and the co like, it is a lie when the enemy you tells became us. became my friend at that conference. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Faye? She became my friend at that I conference. I know. See, that's And she did an Faye. interview with me. She shared that's her funny. testimony on Warrior Women of Faith. That's where I met Faye. A lot of things came out of that. A lot of friendships came out of that. Yeah. And because I heard um, that, like I, 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 I sat there and I heard your testimony and I told my friend Tiffany, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to get her for an <laughs> interview. I, I love her. Yeah. It, it, that was, that was a humbling moment for me, Faye, because I always thought that if I stand up here and I talk about myself and it's all about me and that's selfish and that's stealing God's glory, I should be preaching the gospel. And we are preaching the gospel because the mm. fact is, is that there's so much power. You know, we talk nowadays about why don't we heal anymore? We're supposed to lay hands on people and heal them. And where's the power? The power has gone out of the church and a radical tool in our toolkit of healing yes. other people is giving our testimony massive yes. amounts of healing yes. can come through that yes. you know we've all been there where we're at the end of our rope and we're sad and we're feeling sorry for ourselves and nothing's going to cheer us up and I can't even read the bible and you know and then <laughs> we are online or we're somewhere and we hear someone's testimony and we're caught off guard and we are in tears and we, yes. we, that's exactly what I needed to hear and so what if that person had said well, I'm only going to preach from Romans because I don't want to steal God's glory. And, you know, and, and oh, gee. so, you know, it, it's pride and it's shame. Well, here's my mantra. When you share your testimony, it's a threefold cord. Every time you share your testimony, it heals you. It helps you to talk. It helps you to heal. It helps you to, because you might, just like this evening, Vicki Joy, I heard you say, oh, George brought back something to my memory that I'd forgotten. Yep. Bam. Yep. There it is. There's another spot of healing that came yep. into you just then. This yep. hour that has happened <laughs> to you. Yeah. So George's testimony helped you. That's the second part. When we mm. share our testimony, it helps other people. So when we talk there's somebody that's going to relate to whatever it is, whatever our circumstances are that we have been through. And then the third thing is, is it always gives God glory mm -hmm. because every yeah. time we share our testimony, we're telling other people what wonderful things he's done in our life. Yes. Some of it might be yeah. hard to hear. Some of it might be painful to talk about. Some of it might be, you know, humiliating but it's always about what the father has done where he has brought us from to where we are today and how his power how his mercy how his his grace and his strength can mm -hmm. give us what we need to keep going because yeah. you know I can be in the worst of moods, just like you said, Vicki Joy. I can, I can be down on myself. I can be having a really bad day. I can be angry. And if I come on a show like this, or if I somebody you know wants to know my testimony, or I talk to somebody at the grocery store, I you know, I'll share a story real quick. I was at I my mop had broke, and I was so mad. I was so <laughs> mad that my mop had broke. 
And I had to go out to the store and go buy a new mop. And I don't even know what all the circumstances were now. It's been a while. But I was just really frustrated. So I go and I'm sitting in my car when I pull up and I see this woman standing outside. I went to like a Dollar General or somewhere and I see her standing outside the store. And the Holy Spirit just came on me. And he's like, you need to talk to this woman. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so she she was smoking. So she puts her cigarette out. She goes back inside. So I go and I do my shopping. I go back up to the checkout and there she is. And I strike up a conversation, you know, how's your day? How you doing? She started crying. Hmm. She's like, I'm not good. I just found out that my grandmother has cancer and that she's she might die. And my mom is sick and you know, mm. she had all these things going on inside of her. And so I told her, I said, okay. I said, well, I'll pray for you. I asked her what her name was and she told me and I said, all right, I'll pray for you. So I go back out to my van and I'm writing down her information and I, I'm sitting in my van and I start praying for her right there. Well, I got done and I look up and there she is. She's standing out there again. Mm. And I'm like, Okay, so I rolled down my window and I hollered at her. I said, hey, can you come here for just a second? And she comes over and I said, I really feel like the father wants me to pray for you, pray with you right now, not just pray for you, but to pray with you right now. I said, would you be willing to do that? And she said, yeah, yeah, that would help me so much. And she said, would you pray for my mom too? And she told me, you know, her mom's name. And I did. And, you know, I gave that girl my card and my information. I never saw her again, never heard from her. But that was the Holy Spirit in action. Mm. And from that point on, my day was glorious. I went home and I told my husband, I was like, yay, I'm so happy my mom broke. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the little things like that that we don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know what we can do what our testimony can do what right. we can share with other people and so yeah. you know that's why we should always be ready to give an account to give mm. a, a you know a witness for what the father has done for us yeah and well Faye, and it, you know oh go ahead george oh i just want to say real quickly i know Faye, we need to hear your story but i just wanted to say i don't know why i'm burdened about this and it came to mind so i'm just going to be obedient to god and say this mm -hmm. To the women out there, if there's a woman who has had an abortion and she is mm -hmm. feeling guilty about that, mm -hmm. look, what's done is done. God loves you. Forgive yourself. Ask him to forgive you and move forward. And I wish more women would speak out if they have had an abortion and God has somewhere through that grief and through the guilt, through the depression, through the trauma, healed them. Yes. That they would have the guts and the courage to speak out to help other women who have who are going through that because there are a lot of yeah. non religious women who have had abortions and they have that regret. Yes. Because I know we glamorize murdering our babies, murdering children, but to the women mm -hmm. who've done it and they have that regret, it's an issue that needs to be discussed. And I want Absolutely. I encourage you to talk about it and not worry about other women who may judge you. That's their problem. Yes. Get them. And I could say a lot more things about that, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's important for the women who are struggling with that guilt that they find peace and wholeness and understand that if God can bring me out of the homosexual lifestyle, sleeping with hundreds of men and drugs and alcohol and all of that stuff and whatever Vicky's been through and Faye's been through and so many others, people I know that who, who have come out of Satanism and the occult and the porn industry understand yes. even murderers on death row have given death row have given their lives to Christ. He will forgive you. If you are truly repentant for whatever you've done and you have that remorse, do not let Satan steal that joy and to make you think that God doesn't love you because that grace, that salvation is available to anyone who wants it. And it's merely just humbling yourself and realize I've made mistakes. I'm so sorry, Lord. And I ask you that you forgive me and I want Jesus to be my savior and I want him to come into my life and I want you to be my savior today. Please forgive me of my sins and God will do it. Mm -hmm. So be hopeful.
Amen. Um, amen. We have one sister that said, amen. I had one and it was horrible and terribly traumatic. Now I am training to be a post-abortion advocate. Thank you for saying something. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Lord. Laura, well, thank Laura. you, Lord. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Faye, what, what I was going to say too was another thing that testimonies do is it, it, uh, it exposes the deeds of the devil because as we yes. can see in our world around us, we really have bought this lie that people are different from each other. You know, if I'm from the United States and, you know, you're from Saudi Arabia, we could never relate, you know, and you're a male and I'm a female or you're gay and I'm straight. I'm a Christian. I'm an atheist. We have all of these polarizing little categories <laughs> And we, we, we tend to I think if, if, we're in a, if we're in one camp, we couldn't possibly connect to this other human being in yeah. this camp ever because the most important thing in the world is, you know, my skin color or my who I'm going to vote for. Right. And when, when we get testimonies, we all have this aha moment. Yes. This, person is, this person is telling this incredible story that I could never relate to, like prostitution and drugs. And, and I'm this leave it to beaver or churchgoer. And everything that person just said, I can somehow relate to. Like, I can't relate to the details of the, the places and things. But I, I have been so in shock as this last month, listening to George and April yes. as they tell their testimonies of which I could not possibly relate to any of those experiences and any of those feelings or any of those outcomes. However, I practically snapped my neck off like, you know, cause the, <laughs> cause the, the, root, the root of this isn't if you are sexually abused or not, if you're right. a Christian or not, if you're gay or not, the root of it is you're traumatized somewhere in, in your youth. Satan's a yes. bully. He comes to you when you're little and your brain is forming and there's trauma or there's rejection. And a lot of it is like rejection. If we have these identity crises as young, young kids and in our attempt to, you know, um, get through all of those survival situations, we make decisions like, Maybe people will like me if I do this, or maybe if I hide, you know, I, I can avoid the situation. Like what, whatever we're doing, the, the thing that is the same in every single one of us is we're trying to come up with these coping mechanisms to fill those holes in our heart, to fill the rejection, to avoid the rejection, avoid the bullying. And so you can have someone with a radically different life experience than you, but at the heart, what they're talking about is, George, when you said earlier today, like I always, I look on Facebook and I see these people with their pictures and their family, they, they made all the rites of passage at the right times. And here I am still like back in high school, I haven't even made this like first rite of passage. And, and then the shame comes in and you think, well, I did something wrong or I'm broken or I'm behind the, the eight ball. And like you said, sitting on the sidelines, I've used that metaphor a million times. Um, I, I said, I'm, I'm in the ditch. I, I was like in a, a, on a racetrack and everybody has sped, you know, 200 miles an hour ahead of me. And I'm with the pit crew. I, I was ditched on the side of the road and everyone is out of sight and they surpassed me, you know, and that's the kind of thing where it's like, it doesn't matter if I experienced the things that George experienced or not, or that April right. experienced and they didn't experience my surgeries and my doctors and like, they don't, but it's That's exactly it, right. It's the same. It's the yeah. same. It's it's this desperation to have people. We want we want to to be accepted and in God's favor, and we want love, and we we want to be accepted. And we don't want to be ostracized or mocked if we look a little bit different or act a little bit different or if we're a little bit more effeminate than the other boys in the class. And yes. and and so you know we just we're all in this like survival mode. And, you know, that, that point when Christ comes down and, and offers hope, like I can fill that big, huge empty space and I can, I can fill the, I can heal those wounds. And, and so I just think that if we, if we tell our testimonies, we can actually undo what's happening out in the world because what's Satan's Amen. agenda right now, even as we speak, it's more obvious now than ever. Let's put everybody in these polarizing groups so that they yes. fight with each other. But the things that 
unite us as human beings are all the same. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. I agree 100%, Vicki. Mm -hmm. And I well think, said. you know, I, as I do, you know, as I share these testimonies and, you know, every one of them, I, I identify with yeah. in some way, you know, I can identify with that person and, you know, yeah. it's amazed me. Like, I, I think I even told George this yesterday, like this month, just hearing these testimonies of these mm -hmm. people um, has just, it's really amazed me how much I have identified Yep. You know, I, I've never been in a gay or homosexual lesbian uh, relationship, but, you know, I've been, I was in a very promiscuous lifestyle mm -hmm. for, you know, a, a long period of time in my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the father has healed me of, of these things in a very similar manner. And, you know, that's part of it is healing whatever it is that he's healing you from healing comes in a very similar way yes. for most all of us. Yep. And that is what, you know, that's what we experience is his love. And that's what we can share and understand from each other is God's love because that doesn't change. That's the mm -hmm. same always. Ab absolutely. <laughs> and you know, I'll, I'll give a little shout out too to anybody who might be listening to this. You know, I've heard George say this before, and I am going to admit that I felt this way probably the first you know, 30 years of my life. I went to church every Sunday. I considered myself to be a Christian. I hated Christians. And the reason I did is because they didn't like the girl with the scars all over the face and the stitches and the ugly, you know, like I, I didn't have any friends in youth group. I got made fun of just as much in church as I did at school. You know, it's, it's not cool for Christians to hang around with the, the freak either, you know? And so I thought that they were all hypocrites. The worst bullying I ever experienced in my life was a private school that I went to to hide from because they were going to be nicer to me. And, you know, I learned my Jonah lesson there that you try to run for something. But and so <laughs> I grew up thinking Christians are actually Christians are actually worse because, you know, people of the world are lost and, and they're unhappy, miserable jerks. So if they treat you bad, that's just who they are. But Christians supposedly love everybody. So they know better and they're still doing it. So they're worse. And yes. so I struggled with that too. And um, I was actually ashamed. I wouldn't, I never told anybody I'm a Christian. So like I would say things like I believe in God. Jesus Christ is my, is the most important thing in my life. But no, I'm not. I did not want to be associated with Christians. And mm -hmm. And, and I would do everything in my power to like have my own individuality. So my armor started getting more like, I mean, I would wear heavy metal t-shirts to church just to like make people upset, you know, and like, I just I was a <laughs> troublemaker. And, and so I, um, my, my shout out is if you're in the church, if you're a Christian, um, as someone who went through trauma and was bullied and was ostracized and was judged based on the way that I looked, I can relate more to LGBTQ people than I can the Christians who've been going to church their whole life because mm -hmm. I understand what it's like to be like, you're not cool enough, you know? And, um, and so we have to do a better job as a church of learning the biblical definition of love. You know, you don't, loving someone else genuinely, caring about them, how was your day? How can I pray for you? Hey, do you wanna to go to a movie? That's not the same as I completely approve of everything you think and believe and do. You know, I, it's just, we have got to get better as believers of genuinely, Jesus loved the outcasts. He yes. rejected the people that knew everything and had were, you know, he, why did the outcasts love him so much? Why was he their safe place? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the outcasts who weren't even allowed in the temple under the Levitical law loved this guy. So clearly he wasn't judging them and making them feel like crap or they wouldn't have put up with it. So what 
was he doing? What was Jesus's formula that these people somehow understood that they were sinners and they had to repent, but they still loved being in his presence and considered him his friend? We've got to figure that out. That is powerful. That is powerful. He Mm -hmm. had he had compassion and he mm-hmm. had love and understanding for the the worst, you know, the people that were laying in the streets that stunk, that nobody wanted to touch or come near. You yeah. know, if we could put a scent on what our sin was like, mm-hmm. nobody would yeah. want to come near me. Nobody mm-hmm. would want to yeah. touch me. Nobody. Yeah. I can tell you that. Yeah. And Vicky, that really yeah. disgusting. You know, yeah. That really just triggered even something with me because there is something about those Christians who go to church and put on this air like they have everything together and they have that very condescending, you know, look down upon everyone. And it just would burn me up because it's like, who do you think you are? You know, you're just as guilty of putting Jesus on the cross. And you're going to stand before God and you're going to answer to him just like I am. Who do you think you are? And there was so much anger and rage that I had just seeing this kind of stuff. It's like, how dare you? But I was too, you know, being younger, I just could not articulate then that that's their problem. You know, I unfortunately because of all of the toxic people, whether they were Christian or just people I encountered in the gay community, I internalized it and all of that self-hatred. And instead of me lashing out at them, I just turned on myself and did all of the drugs and the alcohol and Mm -hmm. and everything that I was doing was really self-destruction. And Mm -hmm. I think that's why so many of us go on that path of self-destruction because we don't know how to channel that anger, that rage, that trauma, the rejection, everything that we're going through. And it's like you said, Vicki, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, there are some root core issues that if we all could get those dealt with, because mm-hmm. we're going to all act out differently, whether it's through food, shopping, sex, pornography, drugs, alcohol, those addictions will come into play because of those, uh, the root core issues. Yeah, it, it's a lot of pain. And I just wish Christians would get over themselves and start looking at everyone. If nothing else, take the time to sit down and talk to them. Hey, tell me your story. What have you been through? What was your journey uh, growing up and with your family and uh, having to come to know Christ and, and and just get to know them and have some compassion and empathy. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I know we need to hear your story. Sorry. <laughs> I think we probably are good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I don't want you to think we're not, because I, I, at some point I want to hear about your two near-death experiences. That Absolutely, <laughs> you, you've given us some teasers here tonight, Faye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Do you do you guys want to continue, or do you want to? Um, I don't. I don't know. You guys normally do two hours here. I mean, we're we're good. We, we have we have been this month, and mm-hmm. you know. Um, I need closure. I can't have two out of three. I won't sleep tonight. So, yeah. No, I'm fine. I just, I just want to make sure that David didn't yell at us because you know Faye didn't get to share her story. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. you know, he's a tyrant, and I just didn't want to. We'll be grounded. We'll be grounded. Yeah. Well, I mean, so mine, I guess my my moment happened when I was um, 19. And, um, I had, I was, I was sexually abused from the time I was very young girl. Um, my earliest memory was four years old and I was sexually abused by my father and, and other people. I had a neighbor that sexually abused me when I was five. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, I grew up with this very twisted, um, view of love. Because when my father molested and raped me, he told me that he was doing it because he loved me. So, you know, my my view of love was very, very skewed, mm. <laughs> to say the least. And so um, as I got older, um, I searched for love and acceptance and ways to mm. feel the void and the only thing that I knew was sex Mm -hmm. because that is what I had been 
accustomed to, you know, since I was young, that, that switch had been turned on. And so, um, as I became a teenager, I became extremely promiscuous. Um, you know, I searched for that after I graduated high school, I was, you know, living on my own and I was, you know, just having a blast, you know, drinking and smoking and, uh, you know, smoking weed and doing all those things and just, you know, living it up. It was in the eighties. And so it was, you know, that's what you did. (laughs) 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 And so, um, when I, when I was 19, uh, my grandmother got extremely sick. And I think that she played a big role in this because it brought me to the point where I started thinking about death. I started mm-hmm. thinking about, you know, other things other than just living for the moment, you know, all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I've lived in all different places. I lived wherever I could stay a lot of times where somebody would let me stay with them and live with them. And so I just kind of, you know, would throw my trash bag in the back of my car and take off and go wherever. And, um, when my grandmother got sick, I, I was extremely close to her. I loved her more than anybody in this world. And, um, I, you know, I, I tried to, to understand what it was that she was going through, but I couldn't, you know, I I didn't understand death. I didn't understand what was happening. And I had a lot of questions for her. I asked her a lot of questions, you know, I asked her some of the, the hard stuff and she was, she was ready to die. She told me that she told me that she was, she was, you know, where she needed to be. And, And so at the same time, the father was working on me and I can look back at that now and see how he was using that situation to work with me in my situation. And so I had moved back home with my parents and I was living there and there's a little, I grew up in West Virginia, way, way out in the country and back was just like you would think. (laughs) (laughs) Not not where George lived. <laughs> we were on opposite polar ends. <laughs> but so I started going. They were having revival at this little church. And somebody had invited me to go to revival. So I went. And I went two or three nights. And I sat there and I listened. And, you know, I, I kept feeling that conviction. I was feeling that burning. And that's what I call it was just a burning because I was sitting there, you know, just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know what this is. I don't know how to respond to this. And, and so I knew that I needed to make a move. I knew that the father was calling me, but I was scared to death because I didn't know what to expect of it. And so I, I went, I, and I, I can remember making an agreement. If, if I go back to church to, tomorrow night and there is an altar call, will you give me the strength to go forward? Hmm. Because I'd felt that that particular night, I'd felt that calling and I, I was afraid. And so I did, I went back the next night and I sat there through the whole thing, the very end and they did 20 altar calls and I'm still sitting there. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, there's that one, there's that one person that, that they knew in the church that needed saved and the spirit was calling them. They could feel it. I could Mm -hmm. feel it. So I got up from my seat And this is a church. This is a little tiny country church. That's one room church. And the pews crack when you sit on them, the floor (laughs) creaks when you walk on it, the piano's out of key, you know, the whole nine yards, nobody can sing. (laughs) And so I got up from my seat and I walked down the aisle and I can remember 
it was like I was walking into a tunnel like this. Mm -hmm. And as I walked, it got black and I kept Mm -hmm. going. I don't even know how I, I don't remember like getting there or anything, but I just remember when I got there, when I got to the altar, everything went bright. So there was like this black tunnel that I walked through and then everything got white, bright. And I prayed, you know, somebody prayed with me. I don't even know who, but I prayed and. And, you know, there wasn't any big um, miraculous thing that I can say that happened. Like I didn't feel, you know, like I changed or anything like that. But I knew that there was a change that had taken place in me. And I went home and I told my parents, you know, and my parents were not Christians. They didn't go to church. They had no you know, my dad was into spiritism and that kind of thing. And um, so, you know, it wasn't like it was um, something that was expected. So I went home and I told him, you know, what had happened. And my dad, you know, he, they were both just kind of, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, I'm sure this phase will pass. <laughs> and, you know, that was, that was the beginning for me, but it took, it took a lot of time and a lot of years for me to learn about the father. And so I've, I've been walking on this path for 33 years mm. and, um, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes and I have, I have walked away from the father. There is a period of time when I was going through a divorce, I divorced, I've been married Um, and I was going through a divorce and I had been in the church. I had been in religion and I was, the church had turned its back on me and I felt, I felt devastated. I felt, um, I felt abandoned Hmm. and. You know, David, you were talking earlier about your fear. My biggest fear was abandonment. Mm. That's always been my biggest fear is my is a fear of being abandoned, a fear of being alone. Mm. And that's what the enemy has always used, you know, that I'm going to be alone. That's what's going to happen to me. Mm. And so at that time, I felt like, you know, I had been completely abandoned by everybody, my family my friends, my church family, I had no one. Mm. And, um, you know, so I kind of went headlong into the world during that time. I just decided that I didn't want any part of religion anymore. I wanted nothing to do with any of it. And I was Mm. angry at God over my circumstances. And, you know, I walked away from him. Mm -hmm. But when I was 19, it took me a long time to learn what the father, you know, cause that, that was really the beginning of my healing. And so once I started on that path, you know, the father put people um, there for me that helped me to start walking that out and showing me what healing was and what I could, you know, what I could have. It wasn't always right. It wasn't always mm-hmm you know, the, the right thing, but it was, you know, what I needed at the time to get through. And, and I went through a lot of um, counseling over the years. I went to counselors off and on, you know, for many, many years. Um, you know, I'd go for a while and then I'd feel like, oh, I'm good now. And then I'd stop. And then, you know, another crisis or another pruning season would come into my life. And I'd be like, oh, I I need, I need help again. And I, you know, I would go back to counseling and, you know, I know that counseling isn't always the answer for everybody, but, you know, it did help me through a lot of my, you know, my problems and it helped me to understand. And I think the father used that to help me to heal along with him. You know, um, 
I, George, I didn't ask for the Holy Spirit. I wish I had. I wish I'd had that knowledge and ability, but I didn't. And I, you know, I, I was a rebellious person. I've always been a, a very rebellious person because I wanted, you know, to do things my way. And, you know, so I, I didn't, I always did things the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say, don't think that, I mean, I've had years and years and years of therapy. It was only the last yeah. few years that I got smart <laughs> and finally asked the Holy Spirit to be a part of it. Maybe <laughs> I would have learned all of this a lot sooner and been a much more wonderful yeah. person, but <laughs> it got delayed. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you, George. And I think, you know, I think time and age and wisdom are yeah. all what comes along in your journey because, you know, that's not to say that I don't have problems now that I, there aren't things that I still deal with. I'm 53 years old and I still, I still deal with things that come up, you know, the father is continually, um, you know, wanting to heal me. And just like you said, Vicki Joy, it's not just one part that he wants to heal. He wants to heal all of it. And I love what you said. He goes back to the root. That's exactly what it is. Yep. It's the root, the core of all the problems. Yep. And, you know, not just from the day we're born, but the generations yeah. of right. years and years and years of yep. generations yep. of things that have been brought in on us, you know, because, in the, in the father's scope of time, you know, a day is a thousand years. We can't understand that. We can't even begin to understand it. It's out of our scope of, of understanding. Right. But, you know, we can see how he can heal all of that and bring us to where we're at right now to have the opportunity to share and hopefully um, share, spread that to other people that they can have the same. Well, thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Wow. Faye. Yeah. I think, you know, um, George, when you had brought up the abortion issue and you concluded that with there's hope. And I think the one thing in the world that cannot be manufactured by our own will or superficially or by the enemy, the one thing that, that purely belongs to Yahweh and he and he alone can deal it out when it's asked for and is hope. That's one we, we can't promise it to each other. I can't say like, Oh, George, I can give you hope. You know, I can passionately tell you all these great things and hang in there and all the little like coffee cup slogans, but I can't really bequeath it to you. And, and all of our own, self efforts to medicate with whatever feels good in the moment doesn't yes. lead to last like hope is really that one profound gift that can be we could go 50 years and never have a glimmer of it and if god decides one day you're going to get up and you're going to get bathed in it your whole life can change in an instant it that hope is really the most profound gift in the world and it is absolutely available you know sorry george did you have no, something no, Go ahead. no i was just going to say exactly that's what keeps me going because on the days where i feel so down and discouraged you know it's almost like god will just every once in a while give you that nugget right when you think you're at your breaking point <laughs> and it just changes my whole day yeah. and it's not like i'm demanding god you know do something now but Sometimes I just go to God and say, I'm really at the end of my rope. I'm really tired of this life. I'm tired of the discouragement, the, the attacks, whatever it is, seeing so much suffering in the world. And, you know, God just every once in a while will have somebody or something happen that just turns my whole day around. So you're right. It's, it's knowing God literally can change your whole world just like that. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. I it think my dad... Going. My dad told me one time when I was younger, he's like, Vicky's like the most profoundly wonderful and the most terrible thing about the way this earth is designed is that your whole life can change in a split second. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it could be a phone call saying that that person you love most just died in a car wreck. And he said, but on the other hand, in a split second, God can change 
your entire circumstance because he was talking to me off a ledge at the time, you know, and 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 it's so tr it's so true, you know, and it, he doesn't always operate that way. Like sometimes it's hard work and you're just digging that ditch every day, you know. It's the hard work, but it we literally do live in a world where the the prayers are are. Are, are mounting up in the sensor and you'd never know if you're one prayer away from that sensor tipping like we just gotta keep laying into him and believing that everything could change in a split second i can't imagine it it's impossible for me to believe it but mm -hmm. if i'm just one prayer away from that sensor tipping i don't want to be one prayer short of his his rescue so we gotta right. just keep Going. Keep praying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's so funny that you brought up that word hope because I just did a study on this. Oh. And um, I I was reading a book. It's a a book that I have been reading about called Blessing Your Spirit, and is it's it's really been an amazing book. But he, they were talking about hope, and so I, it just caught me. And I there was something that I was like, man, I got to find out about this. But um, just briefly, hope, is, the meaning of it is to be patient. Mm -hmm. And hmm, it talks about uh, waiting. So you, you, it's a waiting process or being patient when you wait. And the Greek word uh, for hope uh, I didn't write that down and I'm not sure what that is, but it talks about a future expectation. Mm. So the Greek renders that a future expectation, but the Hebrew word um, represents the present of waiting patiently in the present. Mm. So, and um, you know, when we have hope, we can it can be for a future expectation or in the present you know we are waiting but we're also being patient and when we look at the fruits of the spirit it says that you know that hope you know works out you know patience it works through these things so um, I just thought that was interesting. And I, I want to put it all together because the father has just given me so much more about it. But I want to put it all together in like a presentation because I thought that was just so interesting. At least for me, it was. Mm -hmm. But it, it brought up the, um, the scripture of Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25. It says, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I I was just looking here, uh, Faith, at the first like verses two and three in James because it's similar. It's this like progression um, of faith when when we have that perfect and complete, lacking in nothing life that we're all searching for. The step for it is the step before it is patience and yes. the step before that is trials. And so, you know, we look at these, these seasons and these dark nights of the soul and we think, well, this stinks and I just want to get out. But if we let patience have its full effect, in other words, we don't interrupt it with all of our own yes. solutions. Um, it, if, if we let the dark night of the soul play out patiently, hoping, what yes. are we hoping for? We want this, life that is perfect in our a faith that's full and complete lacking in nothing and it doesn't say your trials go away you probably just yeah. start the cycle all over again but but you know i would take a life that where i still live in a world that's fallen and things can go wrong but i would prefer a faith that lacks in nothing than the faith that i've got right now you know so yes. understanding that step one towards what we lack is the trials of various kinds and Amen. patience being that key that unlocks it. And so it seems that that is kind of like the theme of this evening of our conversation. Yeah. And that's a nice way to tie that up um, yeah. is, you know, that hope that we have for, you know, 
our present day and the future. The Father mm -hmm. will provide for us. And yep. even if it doesn't turn around, it, but if you know Jesus, know that this is going to end. That really is what keeps me going when I get so discouraged. It's going to end. And man, it's going to be so great when, when we are with Jesus. Yeah. I can't even imagine what heaven is like. So uh, it's Absolutely. going to be awesome. Absolutely. So it's worth it. Everybody stick Absolutely. it out. Give your life to Christ. If you haven't, do it now. Don't delay. Tomorrow's not guaranteed to anyone. Amen. And um, it's well worth it. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Hallelujah. Amen. So um, I guess it's five till. Did you, either of you have anything else you'd like to add before we close? No, I just want to thank everybody who joined us. And I know two hours is a long <laughs> time to sit. And just for so many, you know, I have been reading the chat as it's come up and so many of you just have been through so much. And yeah. as, as we're telling our testimony, you guys are speaking to us too. And I cannot believe just as we come together as a body, how much suffering and sorrow there really is, but that we're all here today talking about it and, and yes. looking forward to a future that we do have. We do have a future. We will shine bright like the stars of heaven. Yeah. Amen. And I just want to say, I have finally found the one good thing about having met David was meeting you too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find it well, before like then, you but said now earlier, you don't know me that well yet. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. Oh, man. I'm just no. kidding. I have to give Jesus. him grief. <laughs> we have to have a few little Easter eggs in here waiting for him when he listens. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I feel like I'm never trusting Faye with that again. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it has been a pleasure to have the conversation and I'm, I'm grateful for David yes. and especially for giving us this platform. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And thank you to Now You See TV as well for allowing us to uh, share yes. their platform as well. Yes. We appreciate that. And um, so I guess that's all we have. <sighs> Neither of you have anything else. It's been no. great. Thank you, everybody, for listening this evening. And if you have any questions for any of the three of us, you can contact George at www.georgecarneal.com. Mm -hmm. You can contact me at www.warriorwomenoffaith.org. And Vicki Joy. Um, you can get me at vickijoyanderson.com, that's S-O-N, um, or vickijoy2020 at Gmail. Yes. So please, um, and David will be back next week. I, is it next yep. week he'll be back? So yep. David will be back next week. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. And you guys have a very blessed evening. We love you and y'all bless. Shalom. Good night.